Well, good evening, everybody. God bless you. Good to see you here with us tonight as we come to the close of this week. We're coming together to uh, once again focus on another area that is very important for us to address as a church and respond to as the Lord's church. And so I want to uh, begin with a word of prayer and just kind of introduce what we're going to be doing tonight. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for the grace that you've shown us, the privilege that is ours to be in your kingdom. We thank you so much that you have made it known to us and you have convinced us of who you are. We pray, Lord, for those who do not know you and that you would help us to be better equipped to serve you, especially in this hour. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, tonight I felt led of God to present um, a video uh, presentation with uh, Dr. Ken Ham, I believe he is. He's a man of God who actually built a couple of facilities uh, in, I think it's Ohio and Kentucky. They're right there on the borderline of those two states. Had the privilege to take my uh, family and grandchildren there a year or two ago. One is called the Creation Museum. And the other one is called Noah's Ark. They actually did the research and built it uh, according to what the dimensions were as, as best they could uh, from the Bible. And so he is he travels all over the country in different parts of the world. He's originally from Australia, so you hear his accent. But uh, he is a person that believes in the creation, but he also has been really instrumental in um, helping the church to understand the need uh, to to minister a certain way uh, today, especially right now. I don't want to take from him what he says, and so I'll just let him share a little bit more about that. I do want to put forth a disclaimer. You know, uh, he's been in the news, for those who have been watching Christian news, a lot of debates over whether or not the creation took place in six literal days or six age days but his his uh his his understanding of the word i think is very important tonight's topic though really is about how to minister in today's society to minister the gospel and the need for starting in the book of genesis and then going through the scriptures and we won't get a chance to discuss that tonight i just want you to just kind of take little notes along the way about things that stand out to you that we need to pray about. Uh, we may not be able to pray about all those things. I have a list as well. But uh, over the course of this month and, and the remainder of this month, into next month as we begin in May, all the way through as we're preparing now for not, uh, not just Sunday services, but also our ministry with those that we're praying for to give their lives to the Lord. Uh, this is so important. First Friday nights in the month, is a time set aside for us to get with extended family, personal extended family. Second Friday nights, Q and uh, Sherry took last week, dealing with G-Link, learning to love like daddy loves and keeping with our theme for this year. And the the, the third Friday nights, we set aside to deal with, um, third Friday nights, we set aside to deal with, with local or um, national or international issues that the church needs to deal with or address. And this is certainly one. Normally, this would be, you know, just reserved for teaching in the in the summer. But uh, I just sense that we need to deal with it now. Um, and we're not just focusing only on, quote, evangelism, but understanding the world in which we live today so that we can as the Bible says, be wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. Scripture says, he that catches men or wins souls is wise, and we want to be wise. So I'm going to step out of the way. This is about an hour and seven minutes, so we'll probably be closer to a quarter to nine or nine o'clock before we get out um, or, uh, tonight. If you have to leave, we do understand, but it's very important that we get through this. God bless.
Today I'm doing a presentation based on this new book that um, we, ca we brought out about a month ago called Gospel Reset. And it's really about how to present the gospel in a secularized culture. Many people recognize that we, we aren't reaching the culture like we used to. We're not impacting the culture in our Western world. And in fact, when you think about it, America has the largest number of Christian churches, colleges, resources, Christian media in the entire world. But from a worldview perspective, America is becoming less Christian every day. Think about it. There are more Christian resources available now in America than we've ever had before. And yet it's still becoming less Christian every day. The United Kingdom has really gone down from a Christian perspective. It's a very pagan country. And uh, many, many church buildings turned into mosques and antique stores and shopping centres and so on. Australia is becoming less Christian every day. Canada uh, is becoming less Christian every day. We see moral relativism permeating the culture. Uh, the issues of gay marriage, the gender issue, the bathroom issue, abortion issue, racism, uh, euthanasia now, more under discussion uh, in various parts of our Western world. And not only in the culture do we see all these changes, but in the church as well. Uh, Two-thirds of young people are leaving the church in America by the time they reach college age and very few are returning. Actually, the same sort of thing is happening through the whole Western world. It's already happened uh, in the United Kingdom, but certainly happening in a big way in America. And so we did research with America's research group back in uh, 2009. We published the research in a book called Already Gone. That's had a great impact on a lot of churches uh, in our Western world because many, many pastors said that book really challenged them to change the way they were teaching uh, people in their churches and to really emphasize more apologetics and starting with Genesis and building a Christian worldview uh, founded in Genesis. And that's really what the, the research showed is that when the 20s generation who no longer go to church, who used to go to church, uh, when they were asked, why did you leave church? A lot of it came down to the fact they weren't taught apologetics. They weren't taught an answer to the secular questions of our age. They, most of them went to public schools where they were taught material that undermined the Bible. And instead of giving answers in our churches and homes, a lot of uh, churches, Sunday schools and so on, just tell them, well, trust in Jesus. Well, it doesn't matter about Genesis. Well, you can believe what you uh, taught at school about evolution a million years, just as long as you trust in Jesus. But these generations start to realize the message of Jesus comes from this book. And if the first part of the book, that history that's foundational to the rest of the book, is not true, then how can you trust the rest of the book? And that's really what's been going on. We also did research uh, on the 20s generation that attend church regularly. And when we did the research on the 20s generation that are left in the church, I mean, two-thirds two of them have already left the church. What about those that are left in the church? And we published this uh, in a book called Ready to Return. We did that research in 2014. Here's what we found for the millennials that are still in our churches, that are left in our churches regularly attending church, for those that didn't leave. Do you consider yourself born again? 40% outright said no. Do you believe if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven? 65% said yes. By the way, if 65% think you're, if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven, and 40% say they're not born again, that 40% figure is far too low. It means it's much higher. Should gay couples be allowed to marry and have all legal rights? 40% outright yes, 10% don't know. Think about it, 50% of the millennials that are still in our churches will not stand against gay marriage. When we actually did research in 2015 as to how many people would come to the Ark Encounter when we opened uh, the Ark, we also had our researchers ask questions about the spiritual state of the nation. And one of the questions was this, and this is general population study. If you went to church regularly as kids, do you still attend most Sundays or did you stop attending? And notice something, in the 60s generation, 22% of those that went to church have stopped attending. But look what's happening. In the 20s generation, it is 53%. That tells you where we're heading in America. And this has already happened to a large degree in most of the other uh, Western nations. Also, George Varner recently released some research on Generation Z. Now, Generation Z, Generation Z for the Australians, but Generation Z is a post-millennials, right? They're the younger ones, teens, 13 to 18 years old. They're like, twice as likely as adults to say they're atheists. There's a change that's occurring.
And in fact, I want to show you something that should scare us in regard to what's happening in this nation. It should be alarming for us because I want you to realize the state of what's happening here. It, this shows very clearly the church is losing its impact on the culture big time. And let's have a look at this. So researchers in America divide generations into specific groups according to when they were born and they give them names. So the greatest generation, they were the ones born before 1928. Uh, anyone here in the greatest generation, by the way? Because actually sometimes we have one or two uh, in the greatest generation. It means they're in their 90s. Okay, so actually on uh, Sunday night I was speaking in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh and I had one person uh, who was in the greatest generation uh, in the audience. So then there's the silent generation, those born between 1928 and 1945. Any of you in the silent generation? Okay, we see a number of hands. How about the boomers, 1946 to 64? See, that includes me too. See, look at all the boomers in here. Okay, and then Generation X, 65 to 1980. Uh, quite a number of those. How about the millennials? 80s and 90s, the millennials. I, I always like to ask millennials if, if, um, if they know they're here. <laughs> I just, just want to make sure of that, okay? All right, the post-millennials. Any post-millennials here? Younger generation? Uh, there's quite a number of you. Actually, one of the things that I've said a couple of times this week, the, when you look at the post-millennials, the millennials, they're growing up in a culture that is suffering the consequences of the failure of the church and the failure of the older generations to really raise up generations to stand unashamedly, uncompromisingly on God's word beginning in Genesis and know how to defend the Christian faith. And we're suffering the consequences of that right now. If, when you look at the culture and you see where it's at, and you say, what is wrong with the culture? I think that's the wrong question. The question to ask is, what is wrong with the church? And what has happened with the church? I think that is the question to ask. Now, let me show you these graphs. This is from Pew Research. And uh, this was done in 2010. So it excludes the Generation Z. But they're really uh, worse than any of these anyway. So... The attendance at religious services by generation, percent saying they attend several times a week, every week, or nearly every week. Have a look at this. This is in America. In the greatest generation, 56% went to church. The silent generation, 40% of them go to church. Boomers, 32%. Generation X, 27%. The millennials, 18%. And Generation Z are under that. Keep in mind that as these here become the dominant group in the culture. What does that tell you about where the church is at in America? And people, if you want to look in England today, back before the last war, about 50% or more attended church. Today's down to less than 5 or 6%. And in fact, the number of churches uh, in, uh, in England has declined dramatically. Church buildings everywhere that are turned into all sorts of things. That's where America is heading. We're on the same track. We may be 20 years behind, but hey, Generation Z, Millennials, you can help turn it around. And that's what I, I want to talk to us about today. It, it's interesting, you know, one of the things I've seen, when you, when you see what's happening in the church, a lot of churches, one of the things I've noticed in responding to this is saying, well, how, how are we going to make an impact and one of the trends I noticed, see, I travel a lot. I've spoken in churches all across America. I've spoken in all 50 states. I've spoken throughout the world. I've spoken in Western nations and all sorts of other nations as well. But you know what I've noticed in this day and age? See, I see the trends. I go to these churches. I see the trends. And it's, well, to, to try to get people to church and enthusiasm, there's been an emphasis on music and, and, and watering down the teaching of the Word. And one of the things I've noticed, I'm not against music, by the way, I love good music. But one of the things I've noticed is that music has become the dominant feature in church and not the teaching of the word. And I, I see that all across the Western world. And in fact, it's interesting because Lifeway did some research recently and they asked people the top reasons they would consider changing churches. And there was a, a number of these that were given here. But notice something, changing its doctrine, 54% said that's why they would change a church. But music style, 5%. And it's interesting how we think that, oh, music is, is got to be the thing these days. 
And, um, you know, it's a, a lot of churches I go to, I mean, even to set up my computer, I got to get there at two in the morning to beat the praise team uh, because they will practice all the way up to when the service starts and, oh, you're just a speaker. <laughs> I have that problem all the time. Uh, so let's go and have a look at another graph here from the Pew Research Center, which is a secular group. And views of homosexuality by generation percent saying same sexual relations are always wrong. In the greatest generation, 78% said they're always wrong. Silent, 70%. Boomers, 56%. Generation X, 47%. Millennials, 43%. And I know Generation Z is much less than that. People, what does that tell you about where the state of the church is going to be? We're, just, we're seeing more and more churches like the Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, who, who are saying it's okay to, to have uh, gay pastors and, and uh, gay marriage and all the rest of it. And it, it's also interesting, another uh, interesting statistic that came out from Crossway just recently looked at people when they read their Bible in the church, which do you read most often and which do you find hardest to understand? Notice something. What... What do people in the church read most often? Well, it's uh, down here, and you see uh, what they're reading most often uh, is uh, Romans to Revelation, Matthew, Acts. What are they le reading least often? Uh, the Old Testament, and certainly Genesis, is least read. It's interesting how people have this focus on the Gospels and the end, not the beginning. And people, that's exactly what I want to tell you is, What's happened is much of the church has ignored the beginning, said Genesis doesn't matter, don't know what to do with it, it's too hard. Many pastors have said you can believe in evolution in millions of years. Most of our Christian academics say that anyway. And so they hive off Genesis and say let's just tell them about Jesus. But once you have lost that foundation for the rest of the Bible, then you find the structure collapses. And that's what I want to talk about in regard to evangelism because I want to show you the trends because we know the culture has changed. But the gospel hasn't changed. And the answer, of course, when I ask people, what should we do? And they say, well, the answer is to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. That's true. That's true. But when Billy Graham, who really uh, you know, was a man that presented the gospel all around the world, when he passed away recently, he was the headline in Yahoo News. There'll never be another Billy Graham because the world that made him possible is gone. The secular world recognizes our world has changed. And Tucker Carlson uh, said this about Billy Graham on Fox News. The great evangelist Billy Graham died today. He was 99 years old. There are a lot of remarkable things about Graham's life, but maybe the most striking is this. Within living memory, a fairly orthodox Christian became a national celebrity in this country. Graham ministered to presidents and actors and captains of industry, all of whom were proud to talk to him in public. Graham didn't become rich and famous by promoting self-actualization or selling real estate advice or staging walks over hot coals. He never one time said, you go girl. He basically just preached the Bible. In the America of the time, that was enough. People stopped him on the street to shake his hand. We live in a different country now. We live in a different country now. And we do. We live in a different country. When Billy Graham came to Australia in 1959, I was a little boy, my father said, the Bible says man is coming to Australia. He was known for saying, the Bible says you're a sinner, repent of your sin. The Bible says. Here's the problem. When you say the Bible says today, there are generations that say, but that's a book of mythology. We know science has disproved it. We learn at school, you can't trust it. And so... When you said the Bible says generations ago, then people had a respect for the Bible. You say the Bible says today, and they're saying, we, we don't listen to that stuff. That's an outdated book. It's a book of mythology. 1 Corinthians 1.23, we read this. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. It's interesting, in the Bible, in Acts 2, Peter takes the gospel to the Jews. In Acts 17, Paul takes the gospel to the Greeks. Two totally different responses. And what I'm going to say to you and what I want to walk through here today is this. Generations ago, our culture was like an Acts 2 culture like the Jews. But it's become an Acts 17 culture like the Greeks. And the problem is most of the churches approach our culture as if it's Acts 2. It's not. It's Acts 17 increasingly. And if we don't wake up to that fact, we're going to not be effective in reaching people with the message of the gospel. See... 
I've got an idea for a revolution. I've got a radical idea. This, this, this idea is so radical it's going to blow you off your seats. I'm going to tell you this idea and you're going to sit there and say, how did he even think of that? It is so radical. You ready for it? Here's my radical idea. Okay? How about we start sharing the gospel the way God does it in the Bible by starting at the beginning? What an awesome concept. You would never have thought of that, would you? I mean, start at the beginning. You know, if, if you buy a, a murder mystery book, like Agatha Christie book, what do you do? You read the last chapter, find out who done it, and throw the book away. And you would say, that'd be stupid, because if you don't understand the plot, you're not going to understand what it's all about. But you know what? That's how most people are reading their Bible. They start towards the end. They don't have the beginning. And the problem is, when you don't have the beginning, you won't understand the message. And as I've already said in one of the sessions this week, Genesis 1 to 11 is foundational to all our doctrines. It's foundational to the gospel. If you go out there today, you, you imagine you're told, look, by your church, because actually there are churches that do this. Go out and, and we want you to, to, to go out and reach homes with the gospel. Now, don't get into controversial issues. Don't mention the book of Genesis. Don't even deal with that. And if anyone brings up things like evolution and science, just ignore that. Just go and tell them about the gospel. Can you imagine that? Hey, you're a sinner. Repent of your sin. Sinner? What is sin? Well, um, you're a sinner. Where did it come from? How do I know I'm a sinner? Don't worry about that. Just, just believe it. You're a sinner. And, and Jesus died on the cross for your sin. Why did he die? Well, death was a penalty for sin. Well, where do you find out that from? Where did that come from? Well, don't worry about that. Just believe it. How are they going to understand the gospel if they don't understand that we're all descendants of Adam, that Adam rebelled against God, that sin came into the world, and death was a result of sin, and that's why God's son stepped into history to die on the cross. See, when I ask people in the church to find the gospel, a lot of people say, well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross and raised from the dead. And I say, yeah, but you can't understand the good news without the bad news in Genesis. See, there are people that say, look, we just need to go out and get people saved. I've got news for you. They don't even know they're lost. And if somebody doesn't know they're lost, why will they want to be saved? And so we have to, in a sense, get them lost first. Help them understand that. Look, my father's a teacher, and his father's a teacher, and his father's a teacher. It goes back millions of years, in fact. And <laughs> as a teacher, I like to communicate. For any of you at, at any of the other sessions, I talked about the fact that when, you, when you're trying to talk to somebody or communicate to them the message of Christianity, you need to do it like building a house. You don't start with the roof and then the walls. You start with the foundation and then the walls and then the roof. And I believe in a lot of our uh, churches and Christian homes, we've tried to build the gospel in coming generations by trying to put the roof and the walls on them and they don't have the foundation. They got a different foundation from the, from the education system. See, so I think in terms of the foundation, God is creator, one God. Sin entered the world, death as a result of sin. That's the foundational knowledge to then understand why God's son stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead. That's the power of the gospel. And one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, the hope of the gospel. But you see, when many people think about the gospel today and a lot of the emphasis we have on evangelism in our churches and so on, we're concentrating on the power and the hope of the gospel. We're assuming the foundation is there. And I'm saying we now have generations where not only do we not have that foundation, it's got the wrong foundation. The foundation that man determines truth, the foundation they were given in an education system that is thrown God, the Bible, prayer, creation out. And now the, the foundation is it's man that determines truth. It's the foundation of naturalism. It's the foundation of atheism. That's what it is. And so to help us understand this, I want to look at those two chapters, Acts 2 and Acts 17. In Acts 2, Paul goes to the Jews, or those convinced of, very familiar with the Jewish religion. Day of Pentecost, you can imagine maybe him standing on the temple steps as they're bringing their sacrifices. And he says, you, you, you crucified the Son of God. And God raised him from the dead. It was not possible for him to be whole by death. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, what shall we do and so on? Repent, etc. And then save yourselves from this uh, crooked generation, untoward generation. And 3,000 souls were saved. Wow. 3,000. Wouldn't you like to see a crusade like that in your area? Wouldn't you like to see a revival like that in, in your town? Hey, you know, we used to see revivals like that 
in our Western world. You could go back in history and read about the Great Welsh Revival. There was a famous revival even in Kentucky. There's been revivals in England. There was a revival in the very year Darwin published his book in 1859. You know, you know, and, and, and there were people like Billy Graham that, that went around the world and impacted thousands of people. And, and the, the change would actually impact the culture. People, we're not seeing those sorts of things happening today. Let's be honest. We're not seeing that like we did in the past generations. In fact, look at those statistics. What we see is the secularization of our culture. We're seeing the church losing its impact. And so we have to ask ourselves, why, why was there such a response like that? Well, who was Peter preaching to? He was preaching to mainly Jews, or those convinced of, very familiar with the Jewish religion. Now think about this. At that stage in their history, did they believe in God? Yes. Many gods or one God? One God. So when Peter said God, they heard God, one God. You know why I'm emphasizing that to you? Think about it. Generations ago, when you went to the public schools in our Western world, and you said God, most teachers and students would think of the God of the Bible. But you go there today and say God, and they say which God? There are many gods. See, the word God no longer means to our, our younger generations today what it did to the older generations because they've grown up in a different culture they've been indoctrinated in, in a different sort of education system in fact a number of words have changed meaning do you realize we've got to understand that the younger generations have a different language than the older generations I'll give you another example the word story the word story used to mean history what does the word story in our modern vernacular mean Fiction, fable. And yet, what do we say in our churches? Kids, let's have a Bible story. Let's read this story from the Bible. And so, here's the interesting thing. I, I hear this all the time from any pastor saying, now this story here in the Bible and this story here. But the younger generations, when they hear story, they hear fairy tale, increasingly. And, and you see, if we don't understand that, we're, we're not going to communicate to them. In fact, there's been such an attack on the Bible as a book of history, particularly in the book of Genesis, we should be emphasizing, I'm going to read this historical account here. I'm going to read this account of history, this record of history. We've got to actually emphasize the Bible's a book of history because that's what's come under attack. I mentioned yesterday when we talked about the race issue, the word race has changed meaning. The word race used to mean an ethnic group, cultural group, the, the English race, the Irish race, what, whatever. The word race now, because of the influence of evolution, people tend to think of lower races and higher races and primitive races and advanced races. And, and, and because of that, they also think there are separate races. And as I said, no, we're all one race. We all go back to Adam and Eve. Many words like that have changed meaning. And that trouble is, many people in our churches are using the same terminology from that we used in past generations with the younger generations but they don't understand it or hear it the same way you see Peter could assume that they understood the terms they had the same language but what, who, what was their stumbling block that Jesus Christ was the Messiah remember the preaching of the cross was a stumbling block to the Jews now to the Greeks it was something different, it was foolishness, but to, but to the Jews it was a stumbling block. The Jews were a creation based culture who understood the terms, but their stumbling block was the message of the Messiah. See, we, we need to understand, the Jews had the writings of Moses. They knew about the promise of the Messiah. Th they had that foundational history. They rejected that Jesus was the Messiah. Now. Let me give you a, an analogy here. When my wife and I moved to America in 1987, that seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, so we moved over here as missionaries to a pagan culture, and America is becoming a pagan culture. But I thought it'd be real easy to fit in over here because I thought, oh, you know what, at least we don't have to go to language school like you do in some places and learn a different language. You know what I found out? I thought Americans speak English. You don't speak English. Americans speak American English. It's a form of English. Right? I spoke Australian English. Two different languages. 
I now speak Australian English, American English, English English, uh, and, and so I, I speak a number of different English languages. Right? So, give you an example. So we moved to California, which is a different country anyway, but uh, when we first came over here, and I had a problem, and I said to somebody, could you help me because my battery's flat? And they said, your battery's what? My battery's flat. Did you run over it? <laughs> well, no, I left the lights on. Oh, your battery's dead. Dead? Wasn't alive. It can't die. <laughs> and I, I, I started to realize, wait a minute, you people use the same words to mean different things. You say dead battery, we say flat battery. All right? And, and th there are other ones too, like, oh, I need to put petrol in the car. Every place I went to had gas. How, how do I find petrol? You, you people want, you have gas cars. Anyway, some of you get that, some of you don't, but that's okay. <laughs> and so I had to learn that gas is petrol, it's just, it's not gas. <laughs> I, I studied biology, I studied science at school. <laughs> Solid, liquid, gas, you know? Anyway, and, and then there's the embarrassing ones, like, well, I was on the phone and we had a little baby at the time and somebody said to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm nursing our baby. And you hear this silence on the end of the phone and then this exclamation, you're doing what? I'm nursing our baby, why? That's what I thought you said. And so I realized something was wrong. So I did some research and found out much of my embarrassment, nursing a baby in America is different to nursing a baby in Australia. When you say nursing a baby in Australia, you're saying I'm holding a baby. So I said to this person, I'm holding a baby. I found out that person heard me say, I'm breastfeeding our baby. I thought, Oh dear. <laughs> Maybe this person thought, thought we Australian males had some onward, upward, evolutionary, mutational change of some sort. The advanced species of man. <laughs> and yet, you know, you need to understand this because there are animal parks in Australia that will say to you, would you like to nurse a koala, which could conjure up some horrible images, <laughs> unless you understand that means would you like to hold a koala. And so, what I'm saying to us is, hey people, just coming from Australia to America and I recognise, hey, I had to learn that different words mean different things, you know, or same words mean different things in different contexts. We have to understand it's even much greater between the older generations and the younger generations. And we've got to come to grips with that. See, the Jews had the right beginning, the right foundation, the right history. As I said in one of the other presentations, as we say here at the Creation Museum, ultimately there's only two foundations, ultimately only two religions. It's all the way through scripture, light and darkness, build your house on the rock, build your house on the sand, good and evil, for Christ, against, gather, scatter. It starts in Genesis with trust God, don't eat the fruit from the tree, or did God really say you can become like God? It was a battle between God's word and man's word. And ultimately, that's the same battle going on before us today. It's a battle between two religions. The Jews had the right foundation, the right starting point of God's word. Their stumbling block was the message of the cross. It's interesting, when Billy Graham came to Australia in 1959, and again in the 60s, it's been said that that was the closest Australia ever came to revival. Australia has never had a uh, true revival. In fact, it's a pretty pagan country right now, probably uh, sort of statistics like England, about 5%. Uh, or so would go to church. But Australia inherited the British system. And so in, in, when, in days when I, was a, when I was a kid, when I went to elementary school, when Billy Graham first came to Australia, for instance, at that stage in our history, do you know, teachers had to read through the Bible in the public school to the students. It was mandatory. And in fact, when I was a high school student, I, I remember being on parade, most of the kids did not go to church. But we recited the Lord's Prayer before we went into school. Now, today, teachers don't read through the Bible in school in Australia. There's no Lord's Prayer on, on assembly or anything. In fact, it's just like America. They've thrown basically God, Bible, prayer, creation out of the public school system. But here's what I want us to understand is this. When Billy Graham first came to Australia, I would say Australia was much more an Acts 2 type culture. Because if you said Jesus, they understood, oh yes, in the Bible. God, one God. Sin, oh yeah, the Bible talks about sin. Adam and Eve, they sinned. We're descendants of Adam and Eve. The babe in a manger. They had the terminology. 
So it was like an Acts 2 culture. So in a sense, an evangelist could come in and say, the foundation's already there, I need to build the walls and the roof. But that has dramatically changed because we don't see those sorts of impacts like we saw in the 50s and 60s today in Australia. In fact, Australia, like Canada, like the United Kingdom, and increasingly like America, we see the culture has changed and the generations have changed and the church is not having the impact it once had. You know, the secularists understand this. I think in the church, people recognize something's happened, but I think it's the secularists who understand what has happened. Back in 2010, Second Humanist Magazine, Free Inquiry, we read this. A historic transition is occurring, barely noticed, slowly, quietly, imperceptibly. Religion, when they say religion, they usually mean Christianity, uh, is shriveling in America as it already has in Europe, Canada, Australia, across the developed world. Increasingly supernatural faith belongs to the third world. The first world is entering the long predicted secular age where science and knowledge dominate. A change has occurred. The secularists understand the change. You know why I think most of our churches don't really understand the change? Because they helped it happen. Because when we told generations of kids, you can believe in evolution and millions of years and Genesis doesn't matter and we avoided Genesis, we're helping the atheists drag our kids away from the church, from Christianity. Now that's a pretty serious accusation, but I believe it is true. When we compromise God's word, we're helping the atheists. And we handed generations of our kids over to the secular education system anyway. And then we said, you can believe whatever they teach you doesn't matter. Come to Sunday school and we'll have a Bible story. And we teach all these Bible stories. Don't the great fish, feeding the 5,000 and so on. And you know, to this day, most of what we hear from a lot of our pulpits in our churches are the spiritual things and the moral things and the relationships. But here's what I'm telling us. The Bible as a book of history has been undermined to generations of our kids. And we're preaching to them these Bible stories when to them, that's not e they're not even true anymore. What's true is what we were taught at school about evolution millions of years and the Bible's history is not true. It's interesting, this has been bubbling under the surface. I mean, ever since the 1700s and 1800s when the idea of millions of years was popularized and evolution was popularized and the church in England adopted millions of years and evolution and that spread around our Western world and around the world in much of the church. It's been bubbling under the surface that the generations have been changing and we're seeing the younger generations more secularized. And so it's all been there. And then something happened in America about... Well, about 10 years ago, they started to really change the Western world. And it was like somebody then opened the lid and it all burst forth. And I believe that person was President Obama. When he was Senator Obama, back in 2006, he was at a conference called Building a Covenant for a New America Conference. I don't think most people understood what he meant by a new America. He knew very well what he meant by a new America. Here's what he said at that conference. Wherever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, and a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. That was one of the mantras of the president. In fact, he said it all over the world. It's in his book, The Audacity of Hope. Whatever we once were, we are no longer just a Christian nation, also a Jewish nation, Muslim nation, Buddhist nation, Hindu nation, nation of non-believers. What he was saying is, this is a great thing. We're no longer a nation that just believes in one God. We're a nation that now has many gods. We're no longer a nation like many of the founding fathers who even if they weren't Christian, still built their thinking on the Bible, and many of them were Christian, but they built their thinking on the Bible, and so marriage was a man and a woman, and abortion was wrong. Oh, no, no, we're, we're a different nation now. Now, yes, we have the foundation, man determines truth, and so anything goes, except if you tell them you can't, that gay marriage is wrong, and that abortion is wrong. And now we see moral relativism per per permeating the culture. In fact, you could describe it as it's described in Judges 21-25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You want to know what's happened to the Western world? It's very simple. I'll paraphrase it for you. 
when you raise up generations and say the Bible is not the absolute authority of the word of God and man determines truth, then anything goes. And that's exactly how it is in our culture. It's interesting, back in 2009, the front page of Newsweek said the decline and fall of Christian America. And inside there was an article called The End of Christian America. And there was one sentence that really stood out to me. And we could say the end of Christianized West world, the Western world if we want, because it really applies to Australia, Canada, any of our Western world. And here's the sentence that stood out to me, the present in this sense is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. Instead of one God, now there are many gods. And that's why we want to look at an Acts 17 culture, because this is what I believe our West has become. And increasingly, this is what America has become. Really, this describes most of our millennials and Generation Z. Because this is where they're at. See, Paul comes to Mars Hill, Athens, to the Greek culture. And here, it's really the center, the intellectual center of, of the Greek culture, of the, of the world, in a sense. And there were altars and temples and many gods. And there were idols and there were atheists and there were pantheists. I mean, it was everything. And it's described in Acts 17, 8, where Paul is speaking to the Epicureans, the atheists. Atheism is a religion. It, it, they, they have a blind faith belief that everything happened by natural processes. That's their faith. The Stoics, pantheists, basically the universe is God. And then the others that were there and all the different beliefs they had. And so what did Paul do? He preached the same message Peter preached in Acts 2, the message of the resurrection. And what happened? What's this babbler saying? It was foolishness to them. Remember, the preaching of the cross was a stumbling block to the Jews, but to the Greeks, foolishness. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, why the difference here? Well, who is Paul preaching to? Well, Greeks um, that, that, that believed in evolution. They believed the gods evolved. They believed we evolved from the earth. Greeks that had no concept of a creator god, the Jews understood. So you say God to the Greeks, it's, well, there are many gods. Sin, they had no idea, because they didn't have the writings of Moses. They didn't, they didn't believe in Adam and Eve and the fall of man. Uh, they didn't understand the sacrificial system, which actually was started in Genesis when God made coats of skins for Adam and Eve. They didn't understand the promise of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15. They had a totally different foundation. And so when Paul preaches the message of the resurrection, it's foolishness to them. See, the Greeks had no understanding of the foundational knowledge the Jews did. They didn't understand the terms. They didn't understand at all, so they didn't understand the message of the resurrection. They were an evolution-based culture that didn't understand the terms, and so the preaching of the cross was foolishness. Many years ago, I went to Japan for the first time, and... Before I spoke over there, my Japanese translator sat down with me and he said, you realize in Japan there's no Christian basis to speak of. I mean, evolution is taught as fact in the schools and universities just like America. But Shinto is the major religion, also Buddhism. And Shinto, they have many gods. And so here's a problem. If, if, if you use the Bible as your basis of authority and then you tell them uh, that you want to, want to talk about God, I mean, immediately they're going to think, oh, another God with all our thousands of gods. And he said to me, what I'm going to have to do is when you use the word God, I need to define who God is, that he's the one God, the creator God, the God who made everything. If you use the word sin, I have to define what sin is. In fact, you're going to have to start at the beginning, define all your terms, or they're not going to understand the message. You see, it reminded me of New Tribe's mission. New Tribe's mission found when they went to a pagan culture, some isolated tribe in New Guinea or Papua Indonesia or somewhere and they preached the message of the cross they thought they had all these responses till they found out as they delved into it that those people didn't understand the gospel at all they just did what they thought the missionaries wanted them to do and what New Tribes Mission realized was they don't understand the gospel truly so they they said we will have to develop a different way of doing this and they developed a chronological approach to Bible teaching Sort of like what God does in the Bible by starting at the beginning. Why do you think the book of Genesis is at the beginning? Why do you think God put it there at the beginning? 
And it means beginning. Because it's the foundation of the rest. And when they did that and started there and they went through and then got to the message of the cross, then they found there was an incredible response and they understood. Hey people, you know what? I don't think that response that they got first up in some isolated group of people is much different to what's happening in many of our churches where entertainment has become the dominant feature, such shallow teaching, and then we might have thousands at, I don't know, a concert or wherever it is, and we say, trust in Jesus, and we think we have all these responses. Are they real responses? Because I don't see it impacting most of them in their Christian worldview that it's impacting the culture. Is it just they're doing what they thought they have to do? Do they truly understand the gospel? Or, do, or is it they have no foundation and they don't really understand? I think increasingly we've got that massive problem in our churches. Because if we were truly getting all these conversions at all these churches and places, wouldn't we be impacting the culture? But the opposite is happening. We're losing the coming generations. So something is wrong and it's not working. You see, so to the people in Japan that had no Christian basis, the message of the cross, they didn't understand it. Now, think about this. Compare the Jews and the Greeks. If you go into a culture like the Jews in Acts 2, you say, God, they understand. Sin, they understand. Death, yep, death, a penalty for sin, they understand. Their stumbling block is the message of the cross. But when you go to the Greeks, God, which God? There are many gods. Sin, they have no concept. Death, oh, this is an important one. Death? But death has always been here, hasn't it? And I already dealt with this in one of the other sessions, but that is that Hey, the idea of millions of years came out of deistic and atheistic naturalism of the 1700s and 1800s from people who wanted to explain everything, including the fossil record without God. And they said, so all the fossil layers of all these dead things were laid down millions of years before man. Much of the church took those millions of years and said, we can fit it in the Bible before man, before Adam, in the days of creation, in a gap or whatever it is. A lot of the older generation actually were taught the gap theory to fit millions of years in. Or the day-age theory. And we have told generations of our kids, millions of years has nothing to do with the gospel. Actually, the talk I'm going to give you tomorrow shows you millions of years has, is an incredible attack on the gospel. I'm going to show you why. And basically, it's because it means you're blaming God for death and suffering. The Bible blames our sin for death and suffering. God stepped into history to pay the penalty for death to save us from what we did. And you see, here's the problem. Today, the, the, the millennials, Generation Z, one of their big hang-ups with Christianity is how can you believe in a loving God and all the death and suffering in the world? In fact, many of the leading atheists in America, when you delve into it, many of them grew up in church homes and they are in such rebellion against God and they're angry at God. And when you actually talk to them, I tell you what comes up over and over again. Issues like... Something happened in their life, someone died, someone suffered a horrible disease, or someone was abused, and they're angry at God. But I believe it's a failure of the church because we didn't teach them that, wait a minute, our sin and Adam brought death into the world. God stepped into history to save us from what we did. You see... We told them you can believe in millions of years and to them, how can there be a loving God? All the death and suffering and disease you see today has gone on for millions of years. But the Bible says death is a penalty for sin. We forfeited our right to live when we rebelled against God. We don't even deserve to exist. But God in his grace and mercy, think about this. Why is it, as far as we know, there's no salvation for the angels. Why is it that God in his grace and mercy looked down upon man when we rebelled and said, but I have a plan to save you. You're going to have to die. Your bodies will die because you forfeit your right to live, but you have a soul that's made forever and I want to save you. I'm going to step into history and pay that penalty for that sin. Why, why do you do that for us? I think in some ways it's because God knows the temptation was from outside. It was from Satan. It was from the devil, one of the angels. And so God in his grace and mercy said, I'm going to provide a way of salvation for you. But you see, 
If you believe in millions of years, some of the problems we've got in the fossil record, there are animals that have eaten each other and so on. The Bible says originally man was vegetarian and so are the animals. In the fossil record, there's examples of cancer and brain tumors and arthritis. After God made Adam, he said everything is very good. There are fossil thorns in the fossil record, said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible says thorns came after the curse. These two things can't be true at the same time. Which means the fossil record with all the dead things had to come after Adam sinned. Is there anything in the Bible that could explain how you could get billions of dead things after sin all over the earth in layers thousands of feet thick? The flood of Noah's day. It's, it's, it's such an important event to understand. The fossil record is not the record of millions of years. It's a record of the flood. The graveyard of the flood warning us that God has judged the wickedness of man. He judged sin with death. Do you realize when God judged sin with death in the garden, he provided a way of salvation. He promised the Savior right there. And then set up the sacrificial system to point to the Savior. When God judged the wickedness of man at the time of Noah, he provided an ark of salvation. And those who went through the one door were saved as a picture of Jesus, who is the door. In judgment, God brought salvation. And so the point I want us to understand is this. Think about it this way. I'm saying that most of the kids in our Sunday schools and youth groups are Greeks. And when you consider the difference between the Jews and the Greeks, it's the difference between a creation-based and an evolution-based culture, one that understands the term, one that doesn't. One, the, the, the message of the cross is stumbling block to the other, it's foolishness. See, the Greeks are on a different road. Do you realize we've sent our kids to an education system where they put them on the Greek road? A whole different road. And we're preaching to them in our churches and homes as if they're on the other road. And they're not. They have a whole different foundation, a whole different road they're on. And people, that road doesn't lead up to the message of the cross. If you want that Greek to understand the message of the cross, you're going to have to take them off the wrong road and give them the right beginning, put them on the right road so that they will understand. And that's what Paul did. He looked around, saw all these altars and idols, all these different gods. Back when I was in the British Museum in London, I uh, wanted to get a picture of all the Greek gods, and I did. There they are. They weren't very powerful. Couldn't even get out of the glass case. <laughs> and so... Paul looks around and he sees this altar to the unknown God. So he takes something from their own culture and says, let, let me tell you who he is. He's the one God, the created God, the God who made everything. He's not like your gods. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He gives all life and, and breath. He doesn't need things like your gods. And he made from one man. We're all one race. We all go back to Adam. We're all one family. That's why the gospel is for everyone. That's why it's important to understand we're all sinners. That's why... In the session I did yesterday, I talked about the fact there's only one race. Even, even the Human Genome Project declared there's one race. Of course, that's exactly what the Bible says. We're all from Adam and Eve. There's only one race. Different people groups because of the Tower of Babel. You know, in a sense, what Paul was doing and really what we do at the Creation Museum and what we do at the Ark and what our materials do in our Sunday school curriculum and so on, we're walking people through this history that has already happened. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. The history that the world says is not true. The history that much of the church has ignored and even told generations of kids is not true. And we're saying that history is true and we're giving them answers to help them understand that. And then the gospel based in that history is true. The doctrine of marriage based in that history is true. And then they, they, they understand the gospel. We're missing that from so much, so many of our churches. What Paul did was take them off the wrong road, give them the right beginning. But then he got back to preach the message of the gospel, of the good news, of Jesus' resurrection. And when he did that, see, see, I'm not saying the gospel has changed. The gospel hasn't changed. And Paul preached the message of the resurrection, but he recognized to reach the Greeks, you've got to have a different starting point. I'm saying it's the same today. When you go out to the Greeks, the kids in our churches, and young people, and you say, thus says the Lord, the Bible says, they've already been brainwashed against the Bible. 
what we do here at Answers in Genesis is a chronological approach to Bible teaching like new tribes did with those isolated tribes but there's an added factor because most of our world has access to television, the internet, the, they go to a public education system and so they've been so indoctrinated against the Bible and taught evolution a millions of years as fact that not only do we need to start chronologically from the beginning but we've really got to start at a point to help them understand what this book is it is the word of God you don't believe it? Why? What are your questions? Let me give you the answers. Let me help you understand this is what it claims to be so that we can start at the beginning. It's teaching apologetics. And when Paul did that, what happened? Some mocked, same as last time. Some said, we'll hear you again. I believe their hearts were being opened by the Lord. And some believed, not many, but some. There are people that, are, that, that have told me that at their theological college, seminary, they've been told by some of their professors, don't use the, the method Paul did in Acts 17, he only got a few converts. Peter got 3,000. And to this day, we say, see, be like Peter, get out there and boldly proclaim Christ. I've got news to you, from a human perspective, Paul was incredibly successful because he was preaching to outright pagans who didn't have a clue. He had, in a sense, turned Greeks into Jews as types. He had to take people with the wrong foundation, wrong worldview, give them a right foundation, right worldview. People, that's difficult. That's like, that's like going to a whole group of these atheists we have today and talking to them to present the gospel. That's what he was doing. So you've got to understand, Peter was successful in that culture in that way. Paul was very successful in the pagan culture in a different way. And actually churches were built as a result. See, what I'm saying is, our Western world in the past was very much like the Jews. And you could preach the message of the cross, repent of your sins, and people would understand because that foundational understanding of the terms was there. But you know what's been happening in our Western world? You know what's happening in America right now? The separation of the, those with a more Christianized worldview and those with a secular worldview, the chasm between those two groups is widening. It's the separation of the Jews and the Greeks. The older generation more Christianized. The younger generation's more secularized. The older generation's more like the Jews. The younger generation's more like the Greeks. A whole Western world has become very Greek. Because we've sent generations of kids to the Greek education system. They put them on the Greek road. And then we're trying to preach to them as if they're Jews. But we've got a bigger problem. In our churches, we have sent 90 to 95% of our kids to the Greek education system. They've been turned into Greeks. And they watch Greek television, Greek internet, read Greek books and magazines. And we preach to them in our Sunday schools and youth groups and at concerts and wherever we are as if they're Jews. And I get news for you. Increasingly, they're not Jews, they're Greeks. And the trouble is, many of our Christian leaders and many of our pastors and Sunday school teachers, not all of course, but many, have a foot in both camps because they're really, they're really people who, okay, we're going to preach the Bible, but it doesn't matter about Genesis. Or we can believe in evolution in millions of years. And, and, and you know what we do? They concentrate on the spiritual things, the moral things, relationships, and you know, trust Jesus, and so on. But, but we're preaching to Greeks who... who who don't even have the foundation. And, and you know, we, we get these supposed conversions these days, but do they have a Christian worldview? Do they know what it means to have a Christian worldview? Do they really understand that the Bible is the foundation of their worldview? And it starts with Genesis 1 to 11? By and large, no. It's one of the reasons why we produced a four-year Sunday school curriculum, pre-K through adults, called Answers Bible Curriculum, Apologetics, biblical authority, chronological, starts at Genesis, goes all the way through. It's a four-year curriculum. 10,000 churches now are using this uh, to, a, to one degree or another. And they're telling us it's revolutionizing their churches because not only do we teach chronologically through, teach biblical authority, connect Old and New Testament, but we ask ourselves, how does the world attack this now? Let's give them the answers so that they won't doubt God's word. And we teach apologetics all the way through. It's revolutionizing. You see, we've got to understand we're all Greek to one degree or another. The whole world is Greek. Look, I go to conservative churches and I'll speak and people come up to me and say, I've been a 
a, a Christian for 40 years and so on, but I've always struggled with dinosaurs or how did Noah get the animals on the ark or what about the gap theory, other days of creation, ordinary days. Do you know why we ask those questions? Because we've been influenced by the Greeks. And because a lot of our, our theological colleges, seminaries, Bible colleges, the majority of them, they're really Greek colleges. Because they tell generations of pastors, you don't believe, believe Genesis, you can believe in millions of years. The majority of our Christian academics believe in millions of years. Because it's a big pride issue for them. Because they want to be academic, academically respectable to the world. And you see, so what the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, our Sunday School curricula and so on is all about is to take Christian Greeks, you know what I mean by them, and secular Greeks and to take them and turn them into Jews as types. There's a term for it. It's called de-Greekizing. <laughs> now you might say, I've never seen the word de-Greekizing. Well, what is that on the screen? <laughs> right? I made it up. I like that word, de-Greekizing. Because really what I'm doing this week with all the sessions that I'm doing, I'm and, and what we do at the Creation Museum and the Ark, we're de-Greekizing your thinking. When you go to the Ark, and for instance, on the, on the second deck, and you'll see the exhibits about kinds, we're helping you understand. A kind in the Bible is not like species that we have today. It's more like the family level of classification. Helps us answer the question, how did Noah get all those animals on the Ark? He didn't need near the number we think. We help you understand speciation is a result of Processes acting on the genetic diversity God has already put in there. And it can happen quickly. So, so we're giving you answers. And when you're on the third deck, we're, we're showing you how layers like the Grand Canyon had to be formed quickly. And, and according to evolutionists, there's millions of years missing between certain layers. But they were never there. That's a whole thing. And, and, and then we'll answer other questions about fossilization and the ice age catastrophically formed as a result of the flood. And we're giving you these answers that, and, and people go through and say, I never knew that before. Wow, that answers that. Wow, isn't that fascinating? And, and we talk about one race and we all go back to Adam and Eve and we deal with those issues. We're teaching apologetics to de-Greekize the church and the culture. And you know what that does too when we do that? And we're telling you, here's the right road, the right foundation. We see people, and we hear of people, who are saved right here in the Creation Museum, and in the Ark Encounter, and later on, and through the books, and through the website. When you're down at the Ark Encounter, I know some of you have already been there, but when you're down there on the third deck, we have a movie on the second deck, uh, which is Noah, uh, being interviewed by a tabloid newspaper in the pre-flood uh, world before he, as he's building the ark. And uh, then we have on the third deck the same actors in the movie, but now they're coming to the ark in Kentucky. And, you know, what, um, what, we're, what we're doing there with uh, those particular videos is helping people understand the gospel. And in the one on the third deck, we have Ray Comfort preaching the gospel there. And people have already been de-Greekized as they go through the ark. And as one man who saw one of our staff in the gift store said, brought my family here, my son-in-law wasn't a Christian, but after he watched that movie on the third deck, he prayed to receive Christ as Savior. And he said, I've just got an ordinary, an ordinary testimony. I've, I, I grew up in the church and committed my life to Christ and so on, but my son-in-law was saved in the ark. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's what it's all about. And that's what we want to challenge you to do, is to go out and de-Greekize. In fact, I'm going to suggest to us, we need to de-Greekize our own thinking. We need to be de-Greekizing our children's thinking. We need to de-Greekize our Sunday school uh, group. We need to de-Greekize the adults in our churches. We need to de-Greekize our youth group, our neighbors, de-Greekizing them, helping them understand the Bible is true and to help them understand the gospel. And one of the things you'll notice about the Creation Museum and the Ark, and people claim that if we did this, we wouldn't get all these people coming. And that is, we are unashamed of the gospel. 
There is no point in building an ark or creation museum if we're not going to present the gospel. You know what? God has blessed that and honored that. 30% of those who come to the ark are non-Christian. And they hear the gospel. There's no, what's the point of having an intellectual argument about creation or geology if you're not leading people to Christ? That's what our ministry is all about. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do was this. Look, the church is not impacting the culture like it did. And, and, and people aren't being impacted with the message of the gospel. They don't understand it. Let's do something that can impact the culture and reach them where they're at and give them answers so they will be impacted and hear and understand the gospel. Well, I could go on for millions of years and tomorrow I'm going to talk about millions of years, okay, and the days of creation. But just before we dismiss, if I can uh, have you just uh, stay quiet just for two minutes. Um, we have a ministry called Answers in Genesis that actually built the Creation Museum and also built the Ark. And you can go to our website, answersingenesis.org, and thousands of articles. We have a kid's website. We have all sorts of different websites. I encourage you to use that. Uh, as you came in, you would have received a form like this. If you fill it out and become on our list to find out about the Ark, the Creation Museum, all the newest things, latest things, latest resources, and so on, uh, we'll give you a free DVD of my testimony. Uh, we have these pocket guides that are normally $6 each. We give them to you for $2 each. They're great little witnessing tools because I'll answer various questions people have. And they're very short and uh, beautifully produced. Uh, this is also a great witnessing tool. And it's one of my favorites. My son-in-law and I, Bodhi, put this together. And I've always wanted to have an evangelistic book like this. So it has Genesis 1 to 11, which is the foundational history. Exodus 20, the law, the book of John, the life of Christ, the book of Romans, which really is the gospel in detail. Last two chapters are Revelation, new heavens and new earth. So it has those passages that explain the gospel from beginning to end. And then in between, it's got a summary of the rest of the Bible. So it's like a whole overview of the Bible. Then it's got a little bit of apologetics, 10 of the most asked questions with short answers to help you understand that we can answer those questions. The Bible is true. And then what it means to be saved. And we let you have that for a very... Uh, inexpensive price. We also have a You Choose program where you can put together different combinations of books and DVDs for discounted prices. Uh, my book, The Lie, that is the de Greekizing tool for the church. It's really, other than the Bible, the textbook of our ministry to challenge the church to believe God's word beginning in Genesis, how important Genesis 1 to 11 is, how foundational it is to the rest of the Bible. This is the brand new book that came out, which really is the message I gave you today. I put it in book form so people can understand it and they can get it out uh, to, to people. I'll let you into a little secret here. We had someone recently call us who um, actually uh, heard one of my messages at church. A pastor played a DVD of mine. And the person called us and said, we have got to impact the church. Well, I, I understand what, what's happening, the failure of the church. And so they were able to go out there and get some families. They actually funded this. And 1st of September, Gospel Reset, plus a flyer advertising the museum and the ark, is going to be sent to every church in America, 266,000 churches. Every church... Every, every church in Canada, that's about 9,000 of them. Every church in Australia... Uh, no, Canada is 15,000, that's right. Australia is about 9,500. Here's the sad thing. Every church in the United Kingdom, and it's only 4,200 or so. The, even Australia has twice as many on church mailing lists. It tells you where the culture's at. Be praying about that for us. And we're offering every pastor, minister of every church, we're offering them two free tickets to the Creation Museum and the Ark as well. And so we want to impact the church. So please be in prayer about that. And this message presents the gospel. We decided to include all denominations, everything, um, because there are a lot of them that need the gospel. And this explains the gospel. These five books here are 160 of the most asked questions people have today. And they have detailed answers. Young people, get equipped with these answers. Not only will it help you, but when you talk to others, most secularists have no idea why they believe what they do. You've got information. You be equipped. You will run rings around them and be able to witness to them. And those are our seven core books that I encourage you to get. 
Uh, we have other books like Quick Answers, Tough Questions, the Already Gone book, the research we've done. We have other research as well. But this really is a challenge to the church, and it's a challenge in regard to Sunday school literature. Because we found out from our research, the Sunday school literature used in most churches is, a, is problematic, because it's just fluffing stuff. And then we have books dealing with one race, one blood, blood, technical books dealing with speciation, adaptation, and so on, uh, and natural selection. I encourage every college student, high school student to read that. I'm dealing with this, this topic tomorrow, six days, and the age of the earth. We have answers books for middle school and younger. Um, that deal, We have to get these kids at a young age. And that's why I've written a number of books for little kids, how to lead them to Christ. Uh, through the Door and book, rhyme books that deal with all sorts of topics for them. We have history books that fold out the real history of the world in detail. Uh, this set on world religions and cults, I think it's the best set in the world. Volume 3 is about the secular religions. It teaches you how to witness to atheists, how to witness to those in the secular religions. And uh, the two debates I did with Bill Nye, the one here on stage and the one down the ark for two hours as we walk through, uh, they're really great teaching tools and challenging people. And then what, I, what I've done uh, today and uh, what I did yesterday, Monday, we have a, a series called the Foundations Curriculum Kit and it's 12 30-minute videos with a study guide that goes with them. It's an introductory apologetics program. I mentioned our Sunday School Curriculum, our VBS for next year deals with the race issue. Teaches kids, there's only one race, we're all the same skin color, different shades. It's going to be an incredible, powerful uh, VBS uh, our BBS is in, is in the top three in the world as it is, but this one is going to teach kids to deal with racism and prejudice and to have the right view. We so needed a BBS like that. And then one last thing, and that is our Answers magazine. It is an award-winning uh, magazine, family magazine. It has a kids' magazine in the middle. It comes out every eight weeks. And if you subscribe today, we'll give you a free digital subscription. It's high class, searchable digital subscription that you can give to any of your kids, put on any of their devices, as many devices as you have. And so then you've got the print edition for the old people that can't use... <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay, so if you fill out this form you got, you can subscribe to Answers Magazine. I encourage you to do that. You know what it's like these days to even take a photo using a smartphone. You're better off using a two-year-old because they understand how to do it. Well, I'm going to hand over to Larry here, and I'll be out here for meet and greet uh, for half an hour. Well... I know that this is kind of loaded tonight, and I thank you for sticking it out. Many of you, I know, have busy, busy schedules. In my heart, as you can, as you probably can imagine, um, I'm exploding inside. This is what I've been trying to do for a number of years, and I know that it's really great. We had an opportunity, as I mentioned to some of you early from the outset, to actually go to the Creation Museum and also to walk through the ark uh, that's been at least a model of it and he's right there's a lot of a lot of research that's there so much has been done to really help um, the people who walk through christians and people who aren't christian really understand the narrative that god has left us in the word genesis is a narrative it's narrative history um, his account god's account of the origin of the universes, of all the galaxies of, uh, of humankind, um, the reason why we are where we are and why we're like we are. You only get that from uh, the God who created the Bible or had it written for us and the one who created the universe. This is really a, a steep challenge, but it is certainly possible for those of us who are believers uh, we could talk about economic problems, we can talk about political problems, we can talk about so many social problems in our world, and we would really be right to do that. But tonight I felt like God really wanted me to uh, release this film or this video really early, months early, uh, so that we can um, really kind of begin to understand that all of those problems stem from the, the fruit of another one. 
and they're the fruit of humankind not really being in right relationship with our creator, the one and only true living being who has created everything and did not create us without purpose, created us with purpose that's in his own heart for us. I believe that if we will allow the Lord to help us with this, we can truly uh, we can truly be a blessing, especially in our in our time and in our season. And we can help the next generation be more prepared for what God wants to do through them. And so I want to pray tonight about three or four things and just in my heart as we were praying um, that we would really truly see um, the reality of what this brother just just said that we're living in a world whether they realize it or not and whether we realize it or not that has been heavily influenced by not only intellectual thoughts and ideas that came out of the greek culture but also some very profound spiritual ones and while there are many who consider themselves atheists or agnostic they still hold to a lot of these views and values. And so obviously we cannot beat people up or gun them down to make them change or even see the need to change. Only, only God can do that. And so um, what I want to do is just pray first about this with, with the church, that we would see this not as a fad, not as just, get um, Christians, get people saved, quick scheme, but that we would really understand that this is the world that we are dealing with. The Bible tells us not to know one another merely after the natural. And when Paul wrote that, he was really writing to the church and telling us how to deal with each other as believers. But we can apply that principle to the world. We must know them by the spirit, where they are spiritually, where they are intellectually, and and not to oversimplify it, you know, and say, well, it's just the devil. Well, that's true. It is the devil, but they don't see it as the devil, and they see, they see us calling them the devil, but not understanding that we mean they're being influenced by a mindset by an understanding that comes from the devil. And uh, so let's just pray about that tonight. And then there are a couple more things I'm going to come back and pray about, and then we're going gonna to dismiss. And there's several, I'm sure, that you can take with you as well uh, over the course of the, the remainder of this year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that you inspired this man and this team to do now all of these years. Uh, we, we thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for them really putting in the time and the research to help us to see that you do use science to communicate your truth. And we thank you, Lord, that as, a, as students of yours, walking through this world of the scientific and the research that the, and the archaeological and all that they've done, that you are causing your truth, your narrative to be affirmed and confirmed over and over again. I pray, Lord, that in Metro, where there, where there are blocks to this or where there's just kind of a, uh, a ignorance about it or even about the need for it, that you would speak to us and that you would deal with our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand the role that we have in this particular strategy of ministering to people who are really, truly caught, um, caught up in another whole set of beliefs about the world and the universe and about uh, humankind. 
I pray, Lord, that uh, especially for those who may feel like it really doesn't make any difference. This is not how black people think or how my people think or how city people think or how white people think or whatever. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you'd help us to really see what you have, what you've shown this brother. And we pray that our hearts would uh, be prepared, help me as a leader, others who are part of this congregation who can also be instrumental in helping to equip uh, Metro in this way. Help us to do it well in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, one of the things, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is uh, Brother Ham talked a little bit about um, how different things were, what, 50 years ago, 60 years ago in this country, and how there was just a basic belief in God and that the nation that embraced the Billy Graham is, is no longer that. We're no longer that nation. And and that's true. Uh, at the time, if you study the history, though, there were a number of individuals who were who were opposed to to Graham and what he was preaching. But it is true there were a number of people that believed. Patty Hearst's father, William Randolph Hearst, was in the newspaper business, and um, he he heard Graham, and overnight he put his name out there through all of his his influence and. As some say, the rest is history. But it really wasn't Hearst that made him. It really wasn't um, America that made Graham who he was. God made him who he was. But he set him in a culture in America that at least had a belief in God. And uh, yet I want to, I wanna, while I thank God for that, I also want to pray about something that I, have seen over the decades. And that is that even though there were many people that believed in the existence of God, there were many from, from the silent generation, the boomers, that's my group, and, and, and on, who did not believe in God. It, that sounds like a contradiction. But they believed, there were many who believed in the existence of God. But many did not believe in the God that they believed exist. In the way, in the way that Christ tells us that we're, we're to do that by coming to him and giving our lives to him. Uh, and so I want to I wanna pray about that subtle that subtle deception that simply believing that God exists is sufficient and it, or is the same thing as believing in the God who exists um, as the God of our salvation. It's because of that subtle deception that many in the older generations, the silent and mine, raise their children according to Christian principles, at least in terms of some aspect of moral, upright moral living. But in many cases, their children and their children's children, and now we see their children's children's children and children, never really gave their hearts to God. In fact, they were being raised, I like the way he put it, they were being Greek eyes the whole time. They were being filled with completely different ideas and concepts, and they latched onto it. They latched onto it in the in the next generations because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ anyway. And I know we had the Jesus Revolution, and we had great things going on in this country, the charismatic renewal, and many many other movements that God used. But when you study it closely, you'll find that I'm telling you the truth. Many people were observers of movements and of what God did in the lives of some very genuine people. But they themselves, the vast majority, did not receive it. And some of them had parents who forced them to go to church, forced them to attend Christian events, 
forced them to live by moral standard, the moral standard of the Bible, but they never really gave their lives to God. And obviously, not giving their lives to God, they raised their children by not taking them to join with the church. And they raised their children to believe that it was really okay to explore and to choose other options. Because actually, what they had been given had been rammed down their throats was not true. You couple that with the, just the, the normal tendency in the natural world or in the natural mindset to question, to certainly question God. Everyone has a right to question. I think you're cheating yourself when you don't wait on the answer and you supply your own answers or you, you take the answers of people who don't know God. So I want to pray about that subtle deception. What really happened was instead of really becoming believing disciples, trusting disciples in Christ, the way that God really wanted us to, many, many people became moralists. Um, they live by the moral standards in their own strength. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we do come to you tonight, and we do pray. We pray that you would continue to expose this deception. It's going on in our world, in our culture, in our season, in our time, in our day, seemingly more virulent than ever, where there, we, we're now living out the fruit of that deception of simply believing that God exists like the demons and never really putting our trust in God. We pray. Here's the third thing I want to pray about. Father, we pray for uh, you to break through and reveal it, like your word says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that the light of the glorious gospel would shine all the way through to the conscience, to the conscience. I pray that you would, during this season, would break through all of the emotionalism, even the intellectualism, the God of intellectualism, the God of rationalism, the God of emotionalism, that you would break through it all and that you would settle our interpretation war, that you would speak. We know that you are. And I pray that even as we're being further equipped, you would help us to partner with you. Here's the final thing I want to pray about tonight, and that is, just quoted it from 2 Corinthians 4, but there is a dependence on the Holy Spirit that I believe the Lord is emphasizing. Um, I don't think that this is a, Brother Ham doesn't mean this, but I just think it's important that we emphasize it. No matter how well-fashioned our argument can be, even from the Lord, it can fall on deaf ears. It can fall on and be entered into minds that have already been darkened by, by, by the enemy already been blinded by the enemy so much so that even when we're talking there's a different interpretation of what god means and so i'm just praying like you tonight i'm I, i'm praying like like you tonight that the lord will show me the ways that i tend to rely upon the power of the argument that he gives me more than I rely on him to drive the argument home and to convince the, the, the role, the word of God says that the Holy Spirit will, re, the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin, of judgment and of righteousness, not me. The Holy Spirit will Convinced, that's what the word reprove. It means to prove again and again and again. But the idea is the Holy Spirit will convince the world of the existence of sin, of, of judgment, and of righteousness, the need for it, of God's love, of God's narrative, of God's story, of God's being, of God's essence, uh, of God's truth. 
So as we close tonight, why don't let's let's pray about that. Lord, our culture is steeped in what Brother Ham said, man determines truth. And as a result of it, we live our lives literally slaughtering and killing each other, either physically or emotionally or spiritually in some way. And so we pray tonight, God, uh, in the church that you're reviving us, maybe for the first time with some of the ones who are newer, the real level of dependence that we need on you to cause the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus as we speak it and the arguments that we bring about creation, about the world, about the universe, uh, about science, about all of these things, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us a word that the enemy cannot refute, that the spirit of the Lord would break through. Lord, many of us have loved ones who are in these places. We've tried everything. We've spoken the best that we know how. And so we failed. Some of it is because we have assumed that people have the right foundation for us to say the things that we say. Now that we see that many don't, we pray that you would deal with the sense of inadequacy in us, the sense of loss, the ignorance in us, the unpreparedness to minister. And as we are getting prepared, help us, Lord, never to rely only on what we learn uh, theoretically or even conceptually, but to truly rely upon you. I don't know how to communicate this any further, Lord, but I just pray in Jesus' name that our confidence would not rest and our ability to reason, our ability to be intellectual, our ability to convince, but that our confidence would truly rest in you. You are the only one. You are the truth. And I pray, Father, that your grace would cause us to see this in a special way. As we part tonight, as we move into the remainder of this weekend and start the new week on Sunday, we ask you now for the work of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives, in all of our hearts. We totally, completely depend upon you, God. You are our strength. We trust your Holy Spirit to minister your grace and your peace. In the name of Jesus, and everyone say, amen. Look forward to seeing you. Again, on Sunday, for those that can be there, don't forget to, tomorrow morning at 7, there's a prayer time as well. And um, we're get preparing to go to be with Dr. Horner uh, after service on Sunday for the homegoing life celebration for his, uh, his precious wife, Annie, Mrs. Annie Horner. Please continue to lift him up. He said, please thank everyone uh, for your commitment and to pray for them. And we just love them so very, very much. God bless you. Have a great evening.